welcome to our Sunday morning service. Please stand with us as we get ready to sing. The Bible tells us in 1 John 5, 2 through 5, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. We're going to sing out this morning a song called Dwelling in Beulah Land. We haven't sang it in, in a while. The word Beulah means married. And it comes out of Isaiah chapter 62, verse 4. God says that thy land, I will call thy land Beulah, for the Lord delighteth in thee. And the song, as many would think, it's actually not about heaven. This song is talking about living the victorious Christian life as we are the bride of Christ. The Bible teaches us that the believers are the, the bride of Christ and we are married to Christ. And we can live victoriously through the Holy Spirit by following after Jesus Christ. So sing out with us this morning, dwelling in Beulah Land.
hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. us from the love of Christ. And then Paul says, nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us.
Are you thankful God is for us and not against us? The King of the ages, the King of glory. I hope you can sing with as much joy and enthusiasm as these boys and girls this morning. You guys did a great job. Of course, we sang a couple of apparently Wednesday night favorites. So, um, good job. Good to see everybody in church this morning. And uh, I'm just reminded of the scripture, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And uh, we give God glory and praise this morning. Let's ask God to bless the service today. We're going to open in prayer. And you know what? I'm just going to ask, Brother Ken, would you just lift up your voice? Ask God to bless the service. Pray for my dad. He's preaching up in northern Vermont today, too. Ask God to bless their services there. Would you lead us? Dear Lord, we just thank you for today. Thank you for this worship service. God, you are such a great God, worthy of our praise. Lord, we just thank you uh, for meeting us here today. And I ask that you be with Pastor Eric as he's away preaching. Lord, fill him with your spirit. Uh, may he preach what those people need up there, uh, straight from your heart. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this day. Be with our preacher here today, preacher Ethan, and I just thank you for the music. What a, what a good choice of songs. And thank you that my son Joe is up there playing the piano. He did a great job. So we sure do love you. And we thank you for your grace and mercy in our life, Lord. Continue with meetings today. And Lord, I just pray if someone's in this room or uh, online, does not know you, I pray that they find Jesus in the name of yes. friend of all friends, Savior of all the saviors, that other people uh, may find you. We thank you for all things. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Please be seated. Please be seated. Just want to make a couple of very quick announcements today. So if you have your bulletin, just take a quick look. And the number one event that's happening is this Friday night and Saturday, and that is man camp. So if you are a man or a young man, please put your name on the sign-up list. You can also register online. It's only $10 per person. And we also have the schedule of events, and everything's going to get started Friday afternoon. You can come and, and pitch a tent if you'd like, or you can um, come for the evening, go home, sleep in your nice warm bed and then come back that's acceptable too for the less rugged but we will we will not question the manhood of them they can do that what's it is, it is frowned upon. you're scaring people away Nate you're scaring people away so but it's going to be a great time of fellowship and really it's a chance for we as men and you say well you know I don't camp out just come for the Friday night service then or come for part of it because we're gonna just fellowship in the Lord we do have a guest speaker who's coming from Scotia, New York, a good friend of mine. I've known him for many years, Jason Wampler, pastors Victory Baptist in Scotia. And he's going to bring two messages for the guys, one Friday night around the campfire and one Saturday morning. So everything's uh, taken care of from dinner on uh, Friday night through lunch on Saturday. So make sure you grab the schedule, put your name on the list, and um, just put the $10 in and We'll look forward to seeing everybody, all the men there. Um, other announcements, I, uh, my dad asked me to mention this. His life group, the Young at Heart group, is meeting tonight, still at Kay's Creamery. All right. So at Kay's Creamery in Stanford, if you'd like to be a part of the group and you need directions, you can actually talk to Miss Malachuk. She will, it's at 5 o'clock, 5 o'clock tonight. So... And then the other life groups are back in action uh, in October. So just note that life group calendar there as we uh, get back into that rhythm. Um, make sure you take a minute to look at our missions moment for Bo and Valerie Moore, our missionaries to Portugal. And then mark the missions conference dates in your calendar. Friday night, Saturday night, and then Sunday morning on October 21st through the 23rd. That's coming up. Hope that you can plan to be a part of all of that. All right, let's just take a minute and we'll ask God to bless our giving today. Um, would you pray with me? Oh, before we pray, I'm sorry, there was one other thing I wanted to mention. Uh, I've been mentioning it at just about every Sunday morning, and that is we continue to need some helpers for our Wednesday night kid program. 
it has grown. And we are, our bus rolled into a new, a brand new neighborhood on Wednesday night. So we now have uh, boys and girls we're picking up in uh, the, the, Bra um, the Brayton Hill community. We have folks in the Greylock community. And we have some boys and girls from the Mohawk Forest community as well. So we're running a really extended route. Um, and we have some volunteers, but we do need more help. And if you can be a part of that, we need help both in the meal preparation, we need help in just volunteers to do the activities with the kids. Um, so if God is speaking to your heart, if he's tugging at your heart, you can be a part of that. We'll put you on a rotation. Uh, but please speak with me, and I'd love to get you plugged in on Wednesday nights. And so thank you to everybody that has been a part of it. And pray for the boys and girls. It's um, many, many boys and girls coming who don't know anything about Jesus. And we're praying for them to come to know Christ. So uh, just make that a matter of prayer. All right, let's ask God to bless our giving this morning. Father, we are so thankful for how you've blessed us individually, but you've also blessed us as a church, God, with financial resources and property and vehicles and things that we can use, God, to reach people with the gospel. I pray that you'd help us to give cheerfully, knowing that all of our offering is to you. And then I pray that you'd help we as a church to use the money carefully and appropriately. I pray for the uh, missionaries that will receive our gift, Lord. I pray that they would do likewise. And we pray that you'd use the finances that are given to just advance your kingdom. Lord, make us a generous people. And I pray that uh, we would just get involved in, in your work financially. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's stand one last time as we sing, Lord, I need you.
dismissed. Amen. Well, please take your Bibles with me this morning and go to Romans, the eighth chapter today. Romans chapter number eight. We've traced several themes through the book of Romans, and of course our overarching theme is that in the book of Romans we find the heart of the gospel message, that there is good news for this broken world around us. Something tells us that it's just uh, our experience tells us something's not quite right in the world, and the solution is only and always found in Jesus Christ. So... We spent the first five chapters understanding the doctrine of justification, that we are justified only by faith in Christ, that it is what Jesus did and not what we do that accomplishes our salvation. So that's what took place in chapters one through verse number, uh, through chapter number five. But as we come to, came to Romans chapter 6, and now chapter 7 and chapter 8, we're learning not just about our justification in Christ, but we've learned about our sanctification as part of our salvation, that the Holy Spirit changes us, He transforms us. And so what we're learning, and I put this on the front of your handout, the introduction, is that Christ not only saves us from the penalty of our sin, but He gives us a completely new life. And that is through the power of the Holy Spirit. Our new life is through the power of the Holy Spirit. So, I just want to frame this this way right from the beginning. A lot of people, when they think about becoming a Christian, we get, we get focused on that part that is most desperate to us. And that is, I need my sins to be forgiven. I need to know that when I die, that heaven is my home. And so... We come to that realization that, wow, Christ died for me, my faith is in him, and sometimes we stop there. Now, that's a wonderful place to stop, and I'm, it, it, we've accomplished much if we stop by, and we say, you know, I realize I'm saved, I'm on my way to heaven. But one thing that is spoken about so much in the scripture that I think can be de-emphasized is the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The fact that when we become believers, it's not just, it's not simply transactional. And we think very transactionally, okay? I gave Christ my sin, he died, he paid the penalty for my sin, and he gave me eternal life. It's like this, and then I got saved. I believed that and trusted Christ, and and we enter into this transaction where I confess my sin, and then he gives me forgiveness. But the work of Christ is not, is not, only transactional. It's transformational. There's a whole new way of living, and that is life in the Spirit. It's the Spirit life. You can find the Apostle Paul talk about this all throughout the Scriptures. One of the most powerful places is in Galatians chapter number 5, if you want to do a little extra study. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, but he also speaks of it here in Romans chapter number 8. So I want to begin with this first verse that is such a wonderful, wonderful verse to to have as our starting point this morning. And that is Romans chapter 8 and verse number 1. There is, therefore now, no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. How much condemnation is there to those who are in Christ Jesus? There is none. There is no condemnation. And so as I begin this morning explaining the spirit life, or you could say life in the spirit, you'll notice on the reverse side of your handout today, what I want you to see first and foremost is because of this life we've been given in the spirit, number one, we live 
in security. We live in security. Don't miss the fact that this passage opens with a statement of complete and total security. There is therefore now. Well, you've got to ask the question, therefore now? What do you mean now? Well, that puts in contrast to the past. In the past, we lived under condemnation. In the past, my primary identity was I was a sinner. I was lost and I was under condemnation. But there is therefore now. In other words, something changed. In the history of my life, there was a then, but praise God, there is therefore a now. And what is the therefore? What is it that changed that brought me from then, when I was under condemnation, to now, that I am no longer under condemnation? The answer was discussed in the previous chapter. And if you remember where we finished last week, Paul said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And that he answered with the question, but thanks be to God. But thanks be to God. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. The therefore is Jesus. The therefore is salvation in Christ. So you could read this, there is because of Christ, because of faith in Jesus, there is therefore now no condemnation. None. It's complete. It's total. It is 100%. I am secure. Now notice this. It's not only a complete security. Well, before I move on, let me ask, let, let's think about this in the completion. I asked before, how much condemnation? You answered very emphatically, none. There's no condemnation. That means that there's no condemnation for any sin. The worst. There is not a single person, there's not a single person that is, that has gone too far, that, that, that can outrun the grace and forgiveness of God. There's no one. There is no condemnation. Now, notice this. It's not a, just a security in myself, but it's a Christ-centered security. What gives me the confidence? You say, Ethan, are you afraid of th that you will have to answer for the sins that you've committed? I would say no, on the basis of the scripture, because there is no condemnation. Why? Are you really that good of a person? And as much as I'd like to say, yeah, of course I am. As much as I'd like to answer yes, the answer would be no. Because my complete security is not because of my performance, but it's because of my position. Do you see the positional phrase in the verse? What's the positional phrase? It's a preposition, right? That indicates my position. I am, where am I? I am in Christ. You see, if I was just simply in the church, then I'd be, un I'd be afraid that I'd be condemned for some of the things that I've done. There's some people that they, they believe that, well, you need to be in the church because it's in the church that you're safe, but that's not what it says. If it was, if I was in myself and in my ability, or if I was in my works, or if I was in my religion, I would have to fear condemnation. But we sang the hymn last week, and one of, the, one of the stanzas in Charles Wesley's hymn, And Can It Be, No condemnation now I dread. Jesus is mine and I in him. It's because I am in Christ. I've been, by faith, I've accepted Christ as my Savior, and being in him puts me in the realm of his security in the place of safety. Jesus put it this way. He was speaking to the disciples and some Pharisees, and he says, "My father." speaking of his, his believers, he says, my father who is greater than me, he gave them to me, speaking of the people that were his. And he said, he, he used the picture that he says he has them in his hand because the father gave them to him, and Jesus said, no one, no one, 
is able to pluck them out of my hand. John chapter 10. That we are secure in him. There is no religious system in the world that teaches absolute and complete security except for the message of biblical Christianity. Every religion in the world teaches a partial security. If you do this, you may escape condemnation. If you perform this, you may escape judgment. But in Jesus, we begin from a place of complete and total security. It's unconditional. You say, well, well, well doesn't that, well, what about, what about me and what about what I do? Well, the problem is with this. If it is at all up to me, in fact, it was, uh, I think it was Dr. John MacArthur who put it this way, if I could lose my salvation, I would. You understand what, 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 the point there? If it was up to me to stay in Christ, if it was up to me to achieve this state of no condemnation, I would mess it up every time. I couldn't be secure. I, listen, Listen, how much security do you have in your bank account that you control what goes in and what comes out? How much security do you have at times in your relationships? Why would we think that, why would we trust our eternal security to ourselves? We are kept by the power of God unto salvation. Complete security, and it's a Christ-centered security. In fact, let me show you this scripture, John chapter 3 in verses 17 and 18. John 3, 17 and 18. This is right after the famous John 3, 16. Jesus says this, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is what? He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he's especially bad or he's worse than other people? No. Because he or she is just like all of us. He that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Through faith comes ultimate security. And so we have this relationship now with Christ that says this, I will serve you, Jesus, because I love you. I will serve you because of what you've done for me. Unconditional love is the ultimate starting point for a life of service. That I can serve Christ not out of duty, not out of obligation, but I can serve Christ because he has unconditionally loved me. And I can claim that promise, there's no condemnation. But from that starting point, you see now, he introduces this idea that there is a new life in the Spirit, in the Spirit of God. So it says this in verse number 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now I'm spending a little bit more time on verse number one because it, it really frames the whole rest of the passage. No condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So now... The question is this, what is he saying in this statement, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit? Now look at verse number two. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in 
the flesh. Well, more about that in a moment. But what is he describing? We all know we've spent the last two weeks in chapter 7 talking a little bit about the flesh versus the spirit. And when he says, if you look back in verse number 1 to that statement, to them who, uh, to them who, who walk not who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit, he's describing two states of being. There is the flesh life, and there is the spirit life. When you come to Christ, do you belong to the realm of Christ, or the realm, do you belong to the realm of the spirit, or do you belong to the realm of the flesh? The answer is, you belong to the realm of the spirit. You belong to the spirit. You are, as you could say, you are a spirit person. You have the power of the spirit. Now, what you're going to see and what we saw last work is, week is do we always behave according to the laws of the spirit realm? Yes or no? We don't. Sometimes we behave as if we were of the flesh, but we are not of the flesh. We are of the spirit. That idea of being after or of. It's who do we belong to? Who has the power? Who has the right? Who has the authority over us? Before Christ, it was the flesh who had the power over me. But in Christ, it's the spirit. I belong to the spirit. I am in the realm, in the sovereignty of the spirit of God. And so because of that, it's explained how that happens. For, and now, verse number two, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. Verse three, for what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Do you see the picture here? This passage speaks about the, the entire Trinity. You see father, son, and spirit. We, you and I lived in a state of sinful flesh. So God says, I will send my son. God becomes a man in the likeness of sinful flesh, like you and I. Except his flesh is not tainted with sin. And in fact, in his flesh, in the body of Jesus, all sin was judged. All the condemnation was was poured out on the body of Christ. When Jesus became a man, he took our sin. He took all of the condemnation. And by doing so, he judged sin once and for all in the flesh. That means in his body. Verse 3. Where's verse 3? He condemned sin in the flesh. Now, because of that, we live in security. But now, notice what happens. There's a purpose statement. We live now in the Spirit. Verse 4. Why did Christ do this? Verse 4. That. And if you, if you take notes, you'd circle that. There's a purpose in this. And the purpose of what Christ did on the cross, yes, it was to give us eternal life, but it was to give us a new quality of life, this spiritual life. We say, what do you mean? Well, look what it says. Verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in who? In us. Who do we usually think of as fulfilling the law? Who do we usually think of as, as fulfilling the law? We think of Christ, because he fulfilled the law. Now, he is the only one that perfectly fulfilled the law. But what he's saying is this, that we have been, we were saved, we were freed from condemnation so that we would live a life that also fulfills the law. In other words, he brings us into a life of new obedience because we do not walk after the flesh, but after the spirit. So in just very, very simple terms, when I become a believer, Jesus said he would send the Holy Spirit to live inside of me. It's a, it's a bit of a spiritual mystery. It can't be, it can't be seen physically. But literally, at the moment of conversion, 
The Holy Spirit takes up residence. At the moment of faith, the Holy Spirit lives with me. Why? Well, there are different movements that, that explain it with different reasons, and really Romans chapter 8 gives us the ultimate reason. Some people say, well, the Holy Spirit lives in us, and um, oh, I just feel the Spirit moving. I just, I, he didn't, the Holy Spirit didn't come into us to give us a feeling. The Holy Spirit doesn't come in us uh, primarily for us to do supernatural things in the standpoint of miracles. And there are other groups that are like, oh, well, I've got the Spirit, so now I, 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 I do this supernatural thing or I have this, this crazy kind of power. It's not ultimately why the Holy Spirit came. The Holy Spirit came into our lives to literally change the way we live so that we no longer live in a state that's okay with our sin. But now we live in a way where from the heart we obey the word of God. Again, this answers the question. I've had people ask me this, Ethan. So you're saying that I can become a Christian, I can be saved, not by doing anything, only by believing in Christ. Say, yes, that's what the scripture says. And then they would respond and say, but you're saying then I can live however I want, do all kinds of bad, and then if I just say, oh, Jesus saved me, that he'll save me, and then it doesn't matter how I live my life. Well, I'm going to answer yes and no. Because if a person truly understands what takes place at salvation, if a person is truly born again, you cannot escape the new indwelling and empowering of the Holy Spirit. We've all met people who, quote unquote, got religion for a little while in their life. You know what I'm talking about? That, that and you, you probably, maybe even before you were a Christian, I've heard people at, at work say this, oh, he found religion. And usually what that means is something's going really bad in someone's life, and they all of a sudden have this dramatic transformation. And they do the church thing, and they do the religious thing, and they go here, they go there, and they're talking about this. And then after a while, what happens? It just kind of fades away. How many of you, maybe when you became a true believer, your friends or family said that about you? Oh, you found religion. You know what I'm talking about? But what happens over the course of months and years, if you really didn't find religion, but if you really found Jesus, that means you got the Holy Spirit. And it doesn't fade away. It doesn't go away. Because you didn't find, you didn't find a new way for you to live your life. You entered into a real relationship with Christ, and it changed you. And what happens in those people's lives is their friends and their family watch, and at first they say, oh, they found religion, we'll see how long that lasts. And then eventually they start to realize, wow, you have really changed. You've really changed. Why is that? It's because of the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He changes us. Now, that doesn't mean we're perfect. Okay, we're still, we've still got that flesh. The difference is this. Before, I was a flesh person. I walked after the flesh. I was somebody that belonged to the realm of the flesh. But now, I've been changed. And now, I belong to the Spirit. Now, it doesn't mean I don't behave sometimes like I did then. But it means I don't walk under the power of that realm anymore. I live under the power and rule of the Holy Spirit of God who lives inside of me. This is the part of the Christian life that is a, it's mysterious from the outside. Outsiders see, outsiders to Christianity, what they see is people who take the Bible very seriously, people who are very religious, and they don't always understand what motivates the, the Christian. This is something that can't be explained. It can only be experienced. By repenting of our sin and saying, Jesus, I receive you, the Holy Spirit comes inside of us. Why? 
that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. God wants to, to look at us. Now, it doesn't say the law is fulfilled in us, because we know the Old Testament law was abolished with the coming of Christ. But the kind of righteousness that the law required, a true righteousness that only comes through Christ, is fulfilled in us. You see, we live in the Spirit. So I put in your notes, the powerful purpose of the Spirit is that He would display His righteousness in us. And now what He's going to do, He's going to spend a few verses describing the Spirit walk versus the flesh walk. And now it's an opportunity for me to say, all right, I belong to this Spirit realm, but am I walking in this spirit realm? Am I, is my life demonstrating the realities of the spirit? So pick it up with me now in verse number five. They that are, what's it say? What's the phrase? After the flesh, right? They're naturally in the flesh. That's who they belong to, that realm. They belong to the flesh. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally, what's the phrase? Carnally what? Minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. You're noticing here there's transformed thinking. There's a new perspective. I don't think the same way that I used to think. I've just got to ask you this question this morning, right in the middle of the message, have you been transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit? I'm not saying, do you go to church? I'm not asking you, do you read the Bible sometimes? I'm not asking you, do you have a generic belief in Jesus? I'm asking you a question. Have you ever taken that serious step between you and God and said, Jesus, I surrender to you. I put my trust in you. And have you been changed? Have you been converted? Because if nothing has changed, you don't have Jesus. If nothing has changed, you don't have the Holy Spirit. You can, you can add religion. You can do the religious thing. You can add the church thing. It can make you feel better. It can even make you behave a little bit better. But has your mind been transformed? Has your soul been transformed? Are you changed by the Holy Spirit of God? There's, a, there's an important statement here coming up. Verse number 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Verse 8. So then, they that are in the what? Now again, this isn't just talking about people that behave in a fleshly way. It's talking about positionally. They, belong, they are, spiritually speaking, they are in the flesh. It is impossible for a person who has not been converted. It's impossible for a person who's not been born again to do what? To please God. You say, but what about all my prayers? They don't please God because they're not in the spirit. They're in the flesh. Well, what about all my good deeds? They don't please God because you still belong to the realm of flesh. You don't belong to the realm of spirit. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, a Christian might be worried here. They're like, well, wait a minute. Sometimes I behave in a fleshly way. There's assurance in verse number nine. Verse number nine. But ye are not in the flesh. If you're like, oh man, but some... See, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to... I'm, it, there's a balance here. The balance is this. If you've never been changed, you still belong to the flesh. You cannot please God. But sometimes Christians who belong to the Spirit, we find ourselves behaving like we're in the flesh. And so Paul gives us this encouragement, though, and he says this, if you're in Christ, you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. 
We've got to pause at this verse because there's some rich teaching in this verse that will help you answer some questions. In fact, Romans 8 and 9 is a very important, I'm kind of just do a pause and do a little theology lesson here because Romans 8 and 9 is a key theological passage. Notice a few things here. Well, first of all is the obvious. If you have, if you're a believer, are you in the flesh or the spirit? You're in the spirit. You belong to the spirit. You're in the spirit realm. But there's more truth in here. If the Spirit of God dwell in you, well, how do you know that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Well, what does it say? If you belong to Christ, who do you have in you? The Spirit. You ha- Christ and the Spirit come at the same time. That's key. Because there are, there are Christian groups, Christian denominations, that will teach you this. Well, you get saved, you get Christ, but then you have to have some other experience where then you get the Holy Spirit. When you accept Christ, how much of the Holy Spirit do you get? You get all of them. If you have Christ, you have what? The Spirit. And if you have the Spirit, you have Christ. So be careful of anyone who would teach you, well, you have Jesus, but if you want the Spirit, then you need to speak in tongues, or if you, have, if you want the Spirit, then you've got to get baptized, or if you have the Spirit, you have to pray for a second blessing that contradicts this scripture, that if you have Jesus, you have the Spirit. Belongs to you. I've heard it put this way. Through Christ, when we get saved, we get all of the Spirit. The question is, at any given time, how much does the Spirit have of us? Now, of course, he has all of us, but you know, practically speaking, how much of my life do I allow the Holy Spirit to control? That's a different question. But if you have Christ, you have the Spirit. There's more theology in this verse, though. You have the Trinity and the deity of Christ in this passage. Do you see it? The Spirit, the Holy Spirit that we have, whose Spirit is it? It's God's Spirit. It is the Spirit of God. But do you notice in the verse that the Holy Spirit of God is synonymously referred to as the Holy Spirit of who? Of Christ. It's God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of Christ. You have the Trinity that, that, and the deity of Christ and the deity of the Holy Spirit all wrapped up in this verse. This is a wonderful verse you ought to have in the flyleaf of your Bible or in a note somewhere that you can go to often. I think verse number one in Romans chapter eight, you ought to claim there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But then also verse number nine here that teaches us these deep truths about how the Spirit works and who the Spirit is and how we experience Him. When you receive Christ, you receive the Spirit. So the spirit walk versus the flesh walk is about our thinking has been changed. We have Christ's very presence with us. Some people, you know, like to debate fine points of theology, and they'll say, well, does Jesus live inside of us? You know, ask Jesus into your heart, or is it the Holy Spirit? The answer is yes. Yes is the answer. And sometimes we get more theological in the scriptures. Because the, God, refer, yes, Jesus lives inside of me. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is whose spirit? It's his spirit. It's the Father lives inside of me. The Spirit lives inside of me. We get all of God and he lives in us. Man, like we just say this. Some of us have learned this ever since we we're in Sunday school. And it's just like, yes, the Holy Spirit lives inside of me. The creator of the universe, God, dwells in us. We are his temple. And that's a transforming power. We belong to him. Transform thinking, the presence of Christ, and then the Holy Spirit is our hope for eternity. Look what it says in verse number 10. And if Christ be in you, The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit 
of him that raised up Jesus from the dead. What are we going back to now? What historical event are we going back to? The resurrection of Christ. How was Christ raised from the dead? By the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, you just think about the resurrection, that the lifeless corpse of Jesus, that God took, this is, this is worth meditation, that the, the God of life took upon a human body and allowed that body to become a corpse. Dead, cold, lifeless. And on Easter morning, the blood began to flow again. And the eyes opened again. And the body of God, the God-man, was resurrected. His heart beat once again. That power, that power will resurrect every believe at the that power forgive the, the the gruesome terminology but it's the condemned world we live in that very same power that very same person of the holy spirit we will resurrect the lifeless corpse of every believer throughout all of the ages and though and as job said the worms would eat my body in my flesh i will see god because of the holy spirit that this body will die, but that is not the end of the story. And the, the scriptures describe the Holy Spirit as the earnest or the down payment of the resurrection. The fact that I have the Holy Spirit living inside of me now is proof that one day my body, my dead body will someday be resurrected. It sounds, it sounds very theoretical and theological in a sermon where we're all alive. But put yourself in a room with a corpse where most of us have all been at some point in time. And put that true stark reality in front of you. In all of the Sunday school lessons and the scriptures that we that we read become real in that moment. That we believe that the Spirit of God that raised Christ shall also quicken your mortal bodies by the Spirit that dwells in you. And it was about 11 months ago that I stood with my family and my children in the presence of the body of my father-in-law. And my, my brother-in-law walked in and he looked at the body. It was the first time he'd seen him or seen his body. And he said, oh, he's not here. He's not here. But in that moment, in that moment, life and death become real. And we come to church on Sunday morning, and we're going to go eat lunch in a little while, and we're going to go spend money, and we're going to do all the things in our life. It all gets real, folks. It all gets real when we understand that the life that we live is going to end. This mortal life will end. Have you been transformed by the Holy Spirit? And so I could look at that body, and you will look at the body of your loved one someday. And the hope that we have for eternity is the hope that we claim today that we have life, but it's not, a, it's not a mortal life. It's an immortal life. And I'll tell you, those scriptures are what we, they, they just, and there's something that the Holy, and in those moments, the Holy Spirit just breathes out his presence. And he breathes out his assurance that, that this body, our bodies, the bodies of our loved ones, will one day be resurrected in the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, wow. Powerful. You were not created. You were not created for the 70 or 80 or 90 years that you get right here. 
You're created for life and immortality. But what you do with Christ determines all of that. Are you in Christ? Do you belong to Christ? It's serious, but it's powerful. It's life-changing. It's transformational. And it gives us a hope for eternity. It's the Holy Spirit that we have. I'd encourage you to just to think on that. I was going to say something else and about that, and I can't remember. Just read that verse again, because it's, it's, it's just so impactful. But if the Spirit of Him... that raised up Jesus from the dead, dwell in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. I, keep, I can't get away from this, and I guess I need to share it with you because I, I just is... How many of you enjoy, you enjoy poetry and music and all of that? Most of us do, of course. I'd encourage you to jot this name and maybe this song down because I just keep thinking of this song as I quote the scripture. But there's a there's a author and poet and songwriter. He's a little bit quirky. He's one of my faves though. His name is Andrew Peterson, and he wrote a song. Look it up when you when you go home. It's called His Heart Beats. His Heart Beats, and it's not a it's not like a hymn. It's it's more of a piece of Christian poetry put to music describing the resurrection of God, of, of Jesus. And he just puts the resurrection in very physical terms. He talks about the, the heart beating again, the blood flowing through the veins. And you just realize that what a miracle it is. Anyway, I'm, I'm a little bit off my... Look it up. Listen to it. It, it, bless, it blesses me. I get a witness on that, Aaron? You agree with that? <laughs> it's a good song. This is what we're talking about when we talk about the Holy Spirit. It's power for today. It's hope for eternity. This is not about getting religion. It's not about, it's not about who we are and what we do. It's about what Christ has done and what he will do through us. And because of this, whoa, when you think about that, now look at how impactful verse 12 is. Therefore, brethren, in consideration of the hope of the resurrection, in consideration of the power of life transformation in the Holy Spirit, brethren, brothers and sisters, we are debtors. We, uh, we owe a great debt, and that debt is not to the flesh. When you feel those fleshly impulses that say, oh, but this just feels good, just do it. Oh, but you just, you just have this desire to do this, so just give in to that desire. Remember the hope of the resurrection. Remember the power of the Holy Spirit. And to that temptation of the flesh, just look up and say, you know what? Or look inside and say, you know what? I don't serve you anymore. I don't owe you anything. You have never done anything for me. Why should I listen to you? You weak and pathetic flesh. You sinful and sorry sinner. I owe you nothing, but I belong to Christ. And I belong to the Spirit. And I will serve Him. Can I ask you, what did that addiction ever do for you? What did that lust ever do for you except pain and heartache? What did those behaviors ever do for you except ruin your life? Paul says, therefore, in light of the, the power of the Holy Spirit, in light of the hope of eternity, in light of all of this, oh, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, but it's not to the flesh to the Holy Spirit of God. I will serve him. 
This is real Christianity. This is real conversion. That Christ has changed us and transformed us. And I think some of us need a reminder today. Some of us need a reminder of who we are. And some of us need to be challenged to question, am I truly in Christ? Have I truly been changed? If you don't have the Spirit, you don't have Christ. Verse 13, For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die, but if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Ye shall live. And now he concludes this section, or will conclude, with one more powerful truth about this spirit life, and that is this. We live in security, we live in the spirit, and through him, we live as children of God. Children of God. Look at verse number 14 through 17, and this will be the, the final section that we look at this morning. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have received, you have not received, the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of, you say it with me, the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. That was a term of endearment in the customs of the day, whereas Father could be more formal depending on which words you're using. Abba was a familiar term, like as we would say dad or daddy, that, that we would refer to this relationship. Now, we are children of God through the Spirit by adoption. But you need to be careful when you see this phrase adoption because it's easy to think of adoption in our, um, in our 21st century view of adoption. Okay, this was, this was a different practice. In the Greek days, in a great household, there would be all kinds of places in that household, and there would be many servants. Now, a lot of times, the children of the house owner would grow up alongside the servants, and they'd play together. They would, they would live each other, with each other. And there really was not much difference. You can read about this in Galatians uh, 3 or 4. There wasn't much difference between the children of the house owner and the servant's children because they're just kids. They're just running around the household doing whatever they do. But when those children grew up, the difference became very clear. One was a child of rightful inheritance, and one was a servant. But there would be a process, and on occasion, on occasion, a very beloved servant could be placed as a son through the process of adoption. And what would happen is there would be a legal and formal ceremony by which a young man would be now recognized, not as a servant, but as a rightful son of the householder. And with that, all of the rights of inheritance. The picture for you and I is this. Through the Holy Spirit, you and I in this world our status is of the lowest and the lowest servants. And sometimes we come to Christ and we feel like that. We feel unworthy. We feel lowly. But Jesus says that the Holy Spirit comes and the Holy Spirit, through the work of adoption, places us into the family of God with all of the rights and standing of 
well, wait a minute, there already is a son in that household. Who is that son? It's Jesus Christ. He is the firstborn. And so we are brought into the family of God and we are given the same right as Jesus to refer to God as what? Mind-blowing. When Jesus said, when you pray, say what? Say, our Father who art in heaven. Do you know that the custom of the Pharisees, they would never have referred to God that way, but only in a position of fear? Jesus says to his disciples, when you pray, you say, our Father in heaven. And that is because through the Holy Spirit, we have been given the standing in the kingdom of God, the same right as Christ, but it gets better. Because we are not simply, this, this passage is even better, because not only are we given that status by adoption, but we are also born into the family of God by the Holy Spirit. Read on what he says. What he says. Not just children by adoption, but children by birth. Verse number 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are, that we are the children of God. Now some would say, well, isn't this the same thing? But note the word used for sons Adoption of sons has, speaks, of that, speaks of that custom of placing an adult son in the household with rights and inheritance. But now the statement children of God is the more generic term for the offspring, the, the natural born children. And through the Holy Spirit, obviously this links us back to what Jesus said, that if you want to see the kingdom of God, you must be born again. We are children by the placing, the legal placing of the Holy Spirit into the family of God, but we are also children by birth through the Spirit. And now verse 17, and if children, if we are the children of God, then we are what? Then we are heirs. We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ joint heirs with Christ. Everything we've seen today about the Holy Spirit is both now and eternal. That our standing before God because of Christ, he looks at us as if we were Jesus Christ himself. We have all, Jesus says, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, for the meek shall inherit the earth. We are given the place of sonship. It doesn't make us equal with Christ in, a, in a, the sense of nature. He's still deity, obviously. But we are given all of the rights of sonship in Christ. So the ultimate question is this. There's, there's two questions, how we normally finish. First off is, have you received the Spirit? You, again, like I began at the beginning... It's not about getting religion. It's not about doing the church thing. It's about, has there been a real moment in real time and space where you said, I need Christ. I give my life to him. Jesus, I confess you as my Lord and Savior. If that, ha if that has truly happened in your life, you have the transformation of the Holy, Sp you have the Holy Spirit. But until that has happened, you, you are under condemnation. Have you received the Holy Spirit? Secondly, now to, to those of us who have, are you walking in that power of the Spirit? Are you seeing Him change your life? Are you allowing Him to work through you? Are you living as the joint heir with the Lord Jesus Christ? Could you just bow your heads with me and close your eyes? We're going to just respond now to the Word of God as I ask those questions. I want to encourage you, if there is any doubt in your mind, if there's any uncertainty in your mind as to have I truly trusted Christ? Why don't you make today the day that you settle that? Why don't you this morning just surrender that to the Lord and say, Christ, I do believe you died for me. I do want your Holy Spirit to save me. I trust you alone. I don't trust myself. I don't trust my religion. But Jesus, I put my faith in you. 
whether you're in this room, you're watching this video, you're listening to this message, right now, if, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart, would you receive him by faith? Faith alone in Christ. Right now, put your faith in Christ. Christian, for those of us that are the children of God, we have the Holy Spirit. We're debtors to the Spirit, not to the flesh. Is there an area of your life this morning, is there something going on in your life that you need to say, wait a minute, I don't belong to that realm anymore. I don't have to behave that way. I don't have to live that way because I have Christ and I have His Spirit. Would you just take a moment right now and give that over to the Lord? Father, we come to you and we pray together this morning. Lord, I pray for each of us that may be, Lord, there may be some in here that are praying with me. Lord, none of us are what we should be always. But we believe your word. We believe that, Lord, you've given us everything that we need, that we have your Holy Spirit. So Lord, I just give a quiet moment for each of us to surrender whatever habit or sin or behavior or attitude that we need to. Lord, just in this quiet moment, may we each name that to you. Lord, just bless this church. Bless this family of believers, I pray that you'd help each of us, Lord, to walk in your power, walk in your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please stand together.
give us, to guide us, to comfort us, and to lead us. I pray that each and every day we would walk in your spirit, that we would follow your Holy Spirit in every aspect of our lives. Lord, we pray if someone in here has not put their faith and trust in you, that today would be the day that they would believe that they're a sinner, that you died and paid for their sins, and that you rose again, and that you're the only way to heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are so glad that you've taken the time to join us today. If you've been blessed by the message, or if you have placed your faith in Jesus today, we want to hear from you. Maybe you still have questions about what it means to have a personal relationship with Jesus. Please let us know, and we would love to answer those questions from the Bible. We would also be happy to provide you with the Bible and other free Christian resources to help you grow in your faith. You can email us at info at mountgraylockbaptist.com or send us a message on Facebook. You can also call us at 413-662-2107. We would love to hear from you, and our desire is to be a blessing to you in any way that we can. God bless.